Hi everyone, welcome to this next video for my Barons War Let's Play series. What I'd like to do today is have a little bit more of a look at the different types of actions that you can perform during a game turn. We've already looked at um, sort of like how to build a retinue, we've looked at the basic core um, rules on how you play the game, core principles. We've looked at each of the phases, so initiative phase, compulsory actions, new actions, housekeeping. We've looked a bit more detail at what happens when you're broken, shocked, or weary. What I'd like to do now is look a bit more at the actions you can perform, because essentially this is what you're going to spend the majority of the game doing. This is how you gain an advantage on your opponent, and this is how you win the game. I will caveat this by saying I have not yet played a game of Baron's War through to completion. Every time I've played, it's been a lot of back and forth, checking the rules book, trying to make sure we're playing right. And we always miss a million different things. So I can guarantee that I will get things wrong. So because of that, I definitely recommend going and checking out the guys at Wormouth Studios. They're on YouTube as well. They've been producing a, a um, series of videos where they look at the game. And they've done it in a very bite-sized, easy-to-follow um, way. And I've really enjoyed their video. So if you're watching these, definitely recommend going to check them out and seeing how they've done it. Mark Vance, who's the guy who's um, appearing in the videos and explaining the rules, he knows the game inside out. So there's been times I'm watching their videos and my interpretation of the rules has been completely different. And when I go back to the rule book and look, I'm like, ah, oh, heck, I'm wrong. So brilliant video series. Definitely recommend checking them out. So what I'm going to do is we're going to say, for example, that you've gone through initiative phase and you want to start dishing out some actions. So first off, we've got our group. We've got a group here of bowmen. Group of five, they're here in coherency. You can now start dishing out actions, or if your opponent's taken an action which is going to impact these guys, like trying to shoot at them, you can take a reaction. We're going to talk about movement. This is the green token here. Now, a move action to be given either as a, can only be given, sorry, as a action to a group. It cannot be used as a reaction. But you can give it either to the group themselves using their own action or from a commander provided they're within command range. Each unit has a movement um, statistic on its unit profile and that will depend largely on what sort of armor it's wearing. So the guys who wrote the rule book have started off with a six inch move as a standard move distance for a human. I say that because they're bringing out a range of fantasy guys soon, which will be slightly different. Six inches, and then depending on what they're equipped with, that distance can change. So if you've got leather armor, it goes down by an inch. If you've got mail, it goes down by two inches. If you've got a horse, it goes up to 10 inches. But if that horse has any sort of armor on it, so a barded horse, that goes down, I think, by an inch, two inches or more. So... A basic move for guys like this, if they're wearing padded armor, would be five inches. If they're wearing no armor, it would be six inches. There are certain considerations for movement. When you finish your move, you need to finish in coherency. So you need to finish within the bubble. We've talked about that previously. Groups cannot move or run through other groups. So you cannot move or run through a friendly group. For example, if you had a commander set up here, you could not move this group through these guys. If these were enemies, the same would apply. You cannot move this group through this group. The difference there is if you are trying to charge through a group, a friendly group, you can charge through a friendly group. It just hinders the charge. So it would actually take a modifier to the charge and would make it a significantly worse attack than it would be. When you're moving, if you're moving around another group, you must not come within one inch of any group at any point of your move. So if you wanted to move around these guys, you have to give them one inch around. You cannot hug the bases and say, oh, I'm moving around. You have to give them an inch bubble. For anyone who plays Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, this is very similar to the control zone rule in that. So if there's an inch either side of the group, you have to give them an inch clearance to move around. 
groups cannot voluntarily leave the battlefield. You can't move these guys off the battlefield and say, that's it, we're done, they're gone. Warriors from the same group can move through each other, if you're moving. That doesn't matter, because they're still part of the same group. When you're making a move, if we take these guys out of the way, you can move in any direction you want. You can break up your move into different segments. So, for example, say you wanted to move an inch this way, an inch that way, an inch this way. Say you were trying to zigzag in between some terrain. You can. You can move an inch that way, inch that way, inch this way, however you want to do it. The difference there is if you're running. A run action allows you to double your movement. So rather than moving six inches, you'd move 12 inches, which is considerable. It's a considerable distance. This applies to both infantry and cavalry, so cavalry can run as well. But if you run, you become weary, which we discussed previously in the other, other videos. To be able to run, you must have line of sight of the entire distance you want to run. You must be able to see the destination where you want to run to before you start running, and you must move in a straight line. So if these guys wanted to run in that direction, they have to be able to see where they want to go. It has to be in a straight line, and they have to be able to have line of sight. So you can't, say this was here, run past something if it's hindering your line of sight. The rule book itself does have rules for different types of movement, such as climbing, jumping, falling, moving through terrain, moving through different types of area, terrain, obstacles, buildings, all that sort of stuff. But I won't go into that detail. If you want to know that, go and have a look at the Baron's War rule book. But in essence, movement is very simple. It's done in inches. It costs you an action to do. If you want to run, you can double your move but it will make you weary for the rest of the round. Let's talk now about combat. In the Baron's War, there are two different types of combat. There's ranged combat and there's melee combat. Generally speaking, groups are either armed with a ranged weapon or they're armed with a melee weapon. So for example, the knights here armed with swords. The bowmen at the back here are armed with bows. There are some abilities and some units in some of the expansions, I know certainly they're in Outrunner, that allow groups to use more than one weapon. So horse archers are armed with a, a, a bow, and I also think they can have a, either a sword or something else, or a lance. I can't remember exactly what it is, but they can have more than one. But we're going to work on the assumption at the moment that these guys, bowmen are ranged, and the knights are melee. Now, as we've seen in some of the previous videos, the most important stats you need to know during the combat phase or combat action are the attack value, which is the score they must equal or exceed in order to be successful, and the defense value. So the attack value will be on the attacker's profile, the defense value will be on the defense, defending unit's profile. As we said in the very first video, each model contributes one dice to an attack and you have to be able to see what you want to attack. As we go through the flow diagram, you'll be able to see exactly how this works. So first off, we're gonna talk about ranged combat. So we would declare the attack saying that this group of bowmen wanted to attack this group of knights. They get the attack token. This can happen either off their own volition if they're using one of their own actions or it can be the result of a command action either way same thing happens you then need to measure the range now this range is a very short range but long bow bows and crossbows have a maximum range of 20 inches that is long range long range is up to 20 short range is up to 10. This is important because in their profile, they have a different attack value depending on whether they're shooting at long or short. So if we go to the Bowman profile, you can see two values here. The first one is the long range value, 
The second one is the short range value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say these guys are regular bowmen. So if they're shooting at long range, they have to get a seven or higher. If they're shooting at short range, they have to get a six or higher. This, because it's so close, this is short range. So they would have to roll a six or higher to be able to score hits. The defender, if they have an action available to them, can now perform a reaction. So if they were armed with a ranged weapon, they could choose to shoot back if they wanted, in which case their, 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 their combat action will be performed directly after this combat action has been completed. So if they were to lose, take casualties, they roll fewer dice for attacking. These guys don't have a ranged attack, so they are taking a defense action. Defense action will give you a plus two when it comes to saving. So it's a very good one to take, but if you only have one action in a group, it can stop them from doing anything else for the rest of the turn. For this example, we're going to say that they haven't taken a defend action. You then need to check line of sight for each individual model who is contributing to the attack. If, for example, something is blocking, line of sight, and only these two can see, then only these two would actually contribute a dice to the attack. The others do not get to attack. That's why positioning is very important for ranged attacks. This is where the flowchart diverges for melee and ranged attacks. For ranged attacks, you now generate your attack dice. So for these guys, they would generate five attack dice. If they were within range of their commander, say they were within range of this guy who was leading them, they'd get an extra attack dice because he's got the Inspire ability. They want to show off in front of the boss, so they try a little bit harder. They get an extra dice. If we were saying that these guys were attacking, just switching the table very quickly, and these guys were defending, then these guys would benefit from an extra defense. So say, for example, there's two hits done to them, they would get an extra defense dice because their boss is close by. So it's always good, and this is depending on the um, commander's command range. So if they've got a pennant or a banner, it's further than if they don't. So always remember, because it's one thing I always forget, the Inspire ability gives attackers an extra attack dice and gives defenders an extra defend dice. But for the minute, he's not nearby. So these bowmen will generate five attack dice. At this point, you now roll to hit. So as we said, they need to get a six or higher in order to successfully hit. So based on this roll, he would actually hit once. So, hang on one second, just gonna move things around a bit. Right, sorry, just shuffled it around. So a one is an automatic fail. That's gone. Two, two, three would fail because it's not above six. Seven would hit. In this instance, it would be one hit. Let's say, for example, these guys actually also rolled a zero. That zero, or 10, is a critical hit, essentially, if you play in other game systems. That's a super hit, that's an automatic hit. What we then move on to is the defender's defense roll. So, defenders, having taken two hits, get to roll two, to, two dice. Again, if their commander was in, within range, they'd get an extra one. You cannot inspire your own group, though. So, they only get two. So, these guys have a defense value of five, I think it is. Yes, five up for knights. But, you have to assign your highest dice roll to your opponent's highest. So that zero would not be cancelled because a zero can only be cancelled by another zero. So as it stands, that eight would go off against that. That would fail. The five is sufficient to block that seven, 
So that passes. So these two would go. With a zero hit, you do not get a chance to roll a shield. So that would cause a casualty. However, if that zero was instead a nine and the defense roll had been a two, the defense roll has failed, these guys are equipped with shields, so they then get to make a shield roll. They've got medium shields, so an eight is sufficient to cancel out that nine. So they would take no wounds. If they had taken the defense action or reaction, they would actually get a plus two on their defense value. So rather than saving on a five or more, they'd actually be saving on a three or more, except for critical zeros, which still need to be met with a critical zero. Anything above a three would save. So a defense reaction is actually a very good one to take if you feel you're going to take some damage. The knights themselves, pretty good armor, and they've got a shield roll. And if you've got a commander, you can get an ability which allows them to ignore the first wound. So likelihood of them taking damage is probably a little bit lower. One thing I do not yet know the answer to. If, say, we had two hits from the attacking bowman, an eight and a nine, I, as the defender, have to roll two dice. Now, this doesn't matter whether you've done a defense reaction or not. Roll two dice. If I was rolling four, obviously, I'd have to roll one for each knight and then a separate one for my commander. But in this situation, I'm only rolling two. So my question, and I hope someone might have the answer to this. If I'm rolling two, do I have to roll a separate dice for my commander? In which case, if I fail, that's my commander dead. Or do I get to choose to roll two dice for my regular knights? In which case, I wouldn't be putting my commander's life on the line should I fail. Now, obviously, if you're in a game and you get the choice, you want to keep your commander alive, so you'd want to avoid rolling for them for as long as possible. So if anyone knows the answer, please let me let me know. Um, I'm not really too sure. Um, my preference would obviously be in this sort of scenario not to lose my commander. But if anyone knows, you know, drop it in the comments. If we now go back and say that there was a critical hit and the defense roll failed. You can't roll a shield, or if this wasn't a critical hit, you rolled a shield and you failed, you've had someone die. Man down. Boom. So, gets removed from play. These guys then take a one on their morale. If they'd lost more than one casualty, the morale dice would reflect however many they lost. They then get forced back. You're forced back one inch plus another inch for every casualty you've taken. So these guys would go back one, two inches, one, two inches. They move back. Any tokens they've got, for example, would go with them and they'd sit back here. Once you've been forced back, if you need to take a morale check for whatever reason, you'd have to take the morale check. You can be forced back off the edge of the table. If any part of a model's base is off the table, that model flees. So if this was the table edge here and my commander's base was off, he would flee. For argument's sake, if this guy's base was off, he'd flee. You might then have to take a morale check to potentially be broken because you've lost more than 25% of your total starting total. They'd have to take a command test. You also would clock that up to two. So you've got to be careful where you are because if you move off the edge of the table, you can lose warriors from that group and you can very quickly break. And if you break, as we saw in the last video, you have to move directly away from your attacker. So essentially, you'd have 
probably end up running off the table, in which case that group is gone. And if it's your commander, that's game over. So as you can see, ranged attacks can be quite devastating, especially if you're forcing your opponent back. If you've got heavily armoured knights coming towards you and you're firing at them and you're putting a wound on them, you're moving them back two inches. They can only move two inches, or only move four inches forward. So they can go two inches forward, oh, God, say four inches forward, two inches back. It's a very effective way to stop them and to whittle them down. Um, the answer to that is to make sure you have enough terrain on the table. It is a skirmish game. Make sure there's enough line of sight blockers that archers are not getting enough opportunity to shoot across the table. So what we'll do now is we'll reset and we'll come back and we'll look at melee combat. Let's move on now to melee combat. So melee combat works in a very similar way to ranged combat. The exception being that it diverges at this point of the flow diagram. So going through these parts, let's presume that the commander here wants to attack the bowman. He would declare the attack. You then have to measure your range, which in this situation would be five inches. Now, Melee differs from ranged attacks in that you have to consider the distance you need to get to your opponent in order to actually be able to make the charge. So we'll come back to this in a second. Once the action has been declared, the defender can take a reaction. As we saw in the previous option, they can either defend or, because it's melee, they can choose to attack back. But we'll come to those in a little bit. So. You have to check line of sight. You have to check each individual can actually get to can see the enemy to be able to charge them. You now need to determine the charge. So if the group was within their regular move range and they wanted to attack, so these are within four inches, they can simply make the move and charge. If they're further away, say for example they were six inches away, well, six, or even five inches, because you still have to follow this process, even if you're an inch away. You then have to roll to see if you can charge. The attacker needs to roll a d6. Ooh. You then add that result to whatever your movement range is. So they can move four, five, six, seven, they can charge something that was up to seven inches away. In this instance, because there's no morale difference in either of these uh, groups, they would be able to move up and charge. There is a risk reward scenario for this. If you roll a one, the charge fails you essentially just move that distance towards the enemy. I believe you may have to roll a second one, but you essentially you don't get to go forward. You've failed. Your charge has failed. If you roll a six, you get the benefit, and you actually gain an attack dice when you subsequently get into combat. So risk-reward is there. The risk is you roll a one and you fail. The reward is you roll a six and you wallop them. That simulates them going hell for leather, charging as fast as they can, smashing into them and causing absolute carnage. But what we'll say for the minute is that actually there's no need to roll because they're within the usual move distance. If there was a morale difference between these two, you may have to take a morale check. At the bottom of page 37 is a table, which I de definitely recommend looking at, where it gives different modifiers depending on the difference between the two groups' morale. That involves potentially having to take a morale check to be able to charge if the difference is four or more, losing an attack dice. In this scenario, no difference, or gaining attack dice. So very careful to have to look at those because if your group has taken a lot of morale hits, then they're going to suffer more when they're charged, especially if the other group is fresh. At this point, you then move your models up. 
you charge headlong in. What we're going to look at now, very quickly, is who contributes dice to the combat. So everyone who's in base-to-base -base touching generates a dice. So three dice for the bishop, three dice for the defenders. However, you also contribute a dice if you're within an inch of someone who's in base-to-base. -base. So if the bishop's attacking, they get four dice. If these guys are had charged, or if they're taking an, an attack back reaction, they get five dice. This can be particularly um, useful if you're flanking a group. If you're hitting them from the flank, then and you're only in base combat with, contact with these two, then anyone who is more than an inch away, for example this guy, would not contribute a dice. So essentially, you're losing out of dice by flanking your enemy. So let me move these guys into a little bit more so you get a bit of a better view. Then we'll look at the next step. So here we have it. They've charged in. Combat will now commence. As we said, they could take a reaction. We'll talk to those in a minute. These guys have charged in. They have got four dice. You need to look at the profiles for the warriors. So the we're going to say these were regular knights would be a five plus. A regular baron would be a four plus. So that's why you roll a separate coloured dice. We now roll to hit. So this Baron is clearly a hero, while his followers are clearly junk. So in this situation, these three miss. The Baron hits with an eight. If this was a six, that would be a hit. So let's presume that's a six and this is an eight. The defenders then have to make two defense saves. And don't forget as well, Inspire works for um, this as well. So if they're within command range of their commander, they can gain an attack or a defense. Can't inspire yourself though, so the commander would still only have his base amount of dice. Rolling the defense. They are a seven plus for defense. So this would block that eight. This is an automatic fail. So in this instance, they would take one casualty. If any of the attackers have rolled a zero, as with the range stuff, the defenders would also need a zero to be able to counter that. Even if they rolled a nine, a nine would not be sufficient to counter the zero. So if the scores had been like this way around, that would result in two dead. Having killed two, they would take a morale score of two. They've now also lost more than 25% of their initial starting number. So the number they came onto the battlefield with, they've lost more than 25%. They need to take a morale check. If they fail the morale check, they are broken, and they follow the rules from being broken, which include moving directly away, their full movement away from the people who just attacked them. In the same way as what we were talking about with uh, ranged attacks, if they take a defense action, they then get to do their, uh, they get a plus two to their defense roll. So this, rather than needing to save on a seven, would be saving on a five. They can then, if they have chosen, rather than defense, take an attack back, they can then attack back. But now they'd be attacking with three, because they've only got three guys left but they could potentially put a wound on the enemy. Once the combat's resolved, you look at the number of casualties caused by each side. In this scenario here, if these guys had taken a defense, they would have lost because they've suffered two casualties, the other side have suffered zero. If they attack back, whoever scores the highest number of casualties is the winner. The loser is forced back, so one inch plus two inches for every casualty taken. They move three inches back. Get rid of that, pretend they're not broken. So they've moved back that far. Should clarify actually that you take a morale check once you've been forced back. 
So technically, these guys will be forced back three inches. If they then break, they then need to make their full run, full move back. So they go back even further. Um, we'd spoken about move being forced off the table. So if you're forced off the table, even partially, that's it, you're off, you're gone. Well, the, that warrior's gone, you could potentially be broken from that. The winning group from melee combat then get a free move action. So they can move in any direction they want, there's no limit. They can move up to a normal move for them. So these guys could go four inches. They could go four inches in that direction if they want to grab an objective. Um, it's very important as well, you have to charge the closest model to you, or the closest group to you, unless something else applies or you pass a morale check. So if they were lining up the opportunity to charge someone else, they might want to move closer to them. They could, if they really wanted to be vicious, move up to get closer again, to charge in the next turn, to get back in their face and to keep forcing them backwards. Now, the rule book has a whole section on um, terrain and combat and what happens when you're in terrain, what happens with hindered shots, melees and passable uh, terrain. But I was looking through um, the, um, the, the, the paragraphs here and the one that was most interesting to me was defensive positions. So, for example, <clears throat> if... Nighty boy was back here, get up, and you had your full group back alive, arise, and they were behind a barrier, that would count as a defensive position. That prevents this group from drawing a line of sight on them in terms of being able to charge them. Now, I do not think that would prevent you from shooting at them, but it certainly does stop you from being able to charge at them. It wouldn't stop you flanking them and hitting them in the side, but it's an interesting, interesting um, part of the rule book. I think I need to look a bit more at it um, to properly understand it, but that's essentially it. So we've now covered movement, we've covered range combat, and we've covered melee combat. And as you can see, melee and ranged combat are very similar, but the differences to them make it quite a different kettle of fish when you're playing the game. It's very easy, and I've done it multiple times now, to forget steps of the uh, combat phase. So definitely recommend using the rule book, using that flow chart, but then also each step of the flow chart is numbered. They're numbered. And you can follow that through in the rule book. So just do it that way. It's, it's the easiest way to do it. And at the moment, you can just you know get carried away and forget to look at bits of the rule book. But hopefully this has been useful. Um, I've not covered things such as um, heavy war horses, barred war horses, um, their overcharge and their rein in rules. Um, we've not covered any sort of like anything really in terms of like special effects that weapons have. Um, that I definitely recommend. Look in the rule book; it's all there at the back of the book. It explains um, how things like falchions work, how two-handed weapons work, how lances work. Um, this is just intended to be a basic bare bones. This is how you do movement. This is how you do combat. So hopefully. It's been useful if it gets anyone into the game brilliant um, we should now be in a position to hopefully play a game and try and record it it might be horrific um, so it might never happen but I'd really like to give it a go so if you've enjoyed this video please like it share it subscribe to the channel I want to do more balance war content as I said there's several other channels doing some great stuff at the minute uh, Wormouth Studios are doing some stuff. Um, I think the Medieval Wargamer as well on YouTube. Uh, he's got some fantastic videos and he's also started looking at the Baron's War as well. So definitely check him out because he talks through the detail of the rules a lot better than I probably do. But thanks for watching. Hopefully this makes sense. Hopefully it helps. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.